thank you so much, John, for coming to speak and talk about your book. But, and May, thank you so much for the refreshments. That's very special. My pleasure. I'd like to thank the friends, too, for also providing some, but MA has brought so many. And thank you, wonderful audience. And before I introduce John briefly, I'd like to just mention a couple of events that are coming up that families would be interested. Um, Monday, June 9th, the friends are having a group called, a couple called the Wingmasters, who are going to bring in birds of prey into this room and demonstrate North American birds of prey. And we do have, it's free, but there are tickets that you need to go upstairs or call. And for a couple of weeks, friends have priority. And then the summer reading kickoff will be uh, in this room again, June 24th, Ice Cream Social. And the theme of the summer reading is Wild Reads at Your Library, be about animals. So maybe we'll see a lot of you here again. And um, this, I hope John will talk a little bit about himself. And just thank you for coming to talk about your book, Unbelievable. And uh, I'm just thinking of an amazing event that happened last night with John Lester, who's no hitter. Maybe you'll mention that. And the Celtics doing well. So we're in a good mood about sports. You're going to put us in a better mood. <laughs> thank you, John. Good evening, friends. Allow me to start by thanking uh, Flint Memorial Library and especially Helena Mitten, uh, the library director, for this invitation to speak with you tonight. I'd also like to thank my wife, Mary Ann, uh, for coercing many of you to come in here. I know, she, I know she twisted some arms. I hope no one suffered any broken bones. Most especially, I'd like to thank all of you for giving up a little bit of your Tuesday evening to come and hear me speak. I promise to have you home in time to watch tonight's American Idol final. <laughs> While uh, David Archuleta and David Cook have to perform in front of um, Randy, Paul, and Simon, I have to face an even tougher set of critics, my children Maddie and Ryan, who will only be too happy to tell me how I did tonight. <laughs> well, up front, I will confess I'm not a public speaker. I'm the first to admit that I write much better than I speak, and there's a long list of people who think I don't do either very well. So, still have some fun, do a little trivia along the way, and if you're good, we'll give away a book or two. And if all else fails, tonight we'll be saved by M.A.'s delicious uh, snacks. snacks. So, thank you. Uh, I think we all agree that numbers go hand in hand with sports. Uh, whether it's wins and losses, final scores, or uh, team or individual statistics. That's the way it is, and that's the way it will always be. And, and I say thank goodness for that, because it's given me a book to write, and a reason to come out in here to speak with you tonight. But before I start talking about sports and numbers, I want to do a quick exercise with you to show how numbers are actually part of everyday life in ways that we take for granted and don't always appreciate. Um, I, I say, you know, first think about your favorite bands of all time. Uh, when I was young, we had the Jackson Five. Uh, nowadays, we have Maroon Five. We had the, the, well, we had the three tenors, the four tops, the fifth dimension. Today, the kids on the radio listen to, uh, I think it's like a Nine Inch Nails, uh, 50 Cent, Link 182, wow. uh, 311, groups like that. So numbers are part of music uh, as well. Um, how about all the numbers we find in books and movies? Go to your bookshelf at home and, uh, or your video collection. I think you'll come across uh, with the Three Musketeers. The Fantastic Four, The Sixth Sense, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Twelve Angry Men, Oceans 11, 12, and 13, <laughs> Friday the 13th, and all its sequels, Sixteen Candles, 1984, and 2001 A Space Odyssey. So numbers are all through movies. That's for characters. Who can forget R2-D2 and Agent 007. So are you starting to see where I'm going with this? Now, if you move from the big screen to the small screen, on TV we've seen shows like Two and a Half Men, Three's Company, Eight is Enough, 24, 60 Minutes, 48 Hours, Anderson Cooper 360, The 700 Club, and Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? So there's numbers on TV as well. <laughs> Let's not forget numbers that pop up when we're thirsty or want to eat. Either if you're thirsty, you can, you can have a V8, you can drink a 7-Up, or if you're older than 21, you can have a 7 and 7. <laughs> now, if you have to go to the convenience store, you go to see the 7-Eleven. If you want to eat out at a restaurant, 
You can go to the 99 that's down on Route 28. <laughs> so all numbers that we take for granted. Uh, they're just part of our lexicon. Now, if you decide to eat at home, and you make a mess after shopping down a four-cheese pizza, you go to the cupboard and grab your formula 409 to clean it all up. And if you have more trouble, because you can't stop eating those four cheese pizzas, you can enter yourself in a 12-step program. <laughs> Numbers are also part of history. We have the seven wonders of the world, the Ten Commandments, and the 13 original colonies. We have famous years, 1492, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, 1776, which led to the War of 1812, and then we have the famous or infamous dates in history, December 7, and certainly 9-11. Finally, numbers are also part of one of America's most unforgettable speeches. When Abraham Lincoln went to Gettysburg and started off by saying, four score and seven years ago. So, and I can see Joe trying to count back there. 87 years. <laughs> so, they're a part of history. Anybody have any others that come to mind? You can shout them out to me. Elaine is giving me permission for somebody. I know it's a library, but somebody can shout them out. Right? <laughs> What's that? V5? V5. V5, okay. <laughs> Now, okay, I'll give you a couple Oops. more. Oh, tell me what. Kids Pop 12. Kids Pop 12. Kids Pop, an album? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> kids, what are some of the shows kids watch? Ben? 10. 10. Zoe? 101. 101. Moms and dads, if, they, if you find an annoying squeak somewhere, what do you spray it with? WD-40. And days we bought CD, before we bought CDs, we all listened to? 45. And before we had Dairy Queen, at least I hope you had it up here. We had Baskin Robbins. 31 flavors. So, well, no. <laughs> I guess I'm really here to talk about sports numbers. But despite the title of the book, Numbelievable isn't about numbers at all. It's really about the great stories behind the most memorable numbers in sports history. So, and often, as the book demonstrates, a single number can have different meanings to different people. Take the number for seven, for example. It appears three times in the book. Uh, for people who are my age or a little bit older, I don't see anyone out here that's a little bit older, but it might represent the number of gold medals Mark Spitz won at the 1972 Munich Olympics. It was truly an historic achievement at Olympics that are unfortunately more remembered for tragic events. So now if you're a hat golfer, also like me, a seven might come to mind for the number uh, of shots it took John Vandeveld to uh, finish the 18th hole of the 1999 British Open. All he needed was a six to win that historic tournament, but nerves got the best of him, and there's no other way to put it, the result was a disaster, a triple bogey, and he ended up losing the tournament in the playoff. And if you're among the younger people, even though maybe a little bit older than these guys, seven might, come, uh, might represent Lance Armstrong, which was the number of consecutive Tour de France championships. He won a record number, an American cyclist, winning a record number of Tour de France championships after he recovered from cancer. He's truly an inspirational figure. All three, of them, all three of those are covered in the book. But there's more. Seven was also the number worn by a famous Major League uh, Hall of Famer with the Yankees. M who? Mickey Mantle. Mickey Mantle. And, a, and seven was also uniform worn by one of the Boston Bruins' greatest scorers ever. Phil Esposito. Phil Esposito. So, then you have the seven blocks of granite, who was Fordham's famous offensive line back in the 30s. You have seven also means the amount of points awarded for a touchdown and an extra point. And then there's always game seven, dramatic game seven, <laughs> which our Celtics have had a few of already this season. So, so that's one number and how it has all these different meanings. But there's also numbers in sports that have a singular meaning to history. And I just want to go through a few of them that are in the book with you. I'll start with 61 asters. Now, if you're old enough, or if you're simply a baseball junkie, you know that this is the record number of home runs hit by Roger Maris for the, uh, for the 1961 Yankees. The asterisk alone makes the number unique, since for years it was unofficially part of the record, simply to note by historians and the commissioner at the time that it took Maris 162 games to hit 61 home runs, while Babe Ruth hit his 60 home runs, which is the former record, in just 154 games. But the asterisk is only part of the story. To me, Maris is really a sports icon who unfortunately hasn't lived to see his best days. Uh, 
As a teenager in Fargo, North Dakota, he once returned four kickoffs for touchdowns in the high school football game. Incredible. It caught the attention of college football recruiters everywhere. But still, he turned down a football scholarship to attend the University of Oklahoma, which was the best team in the country at the time. Turned it down to sign a baseball contract with the Cleveland Indians. He eventually made the pros and got traded, actually, from the Kansas City Royals to the New York Yankees in 1959. His left-handed swing being perfect for the short porch at Yankee Stadium, which is maybe 310 feet, if I, if I had to guess. So, now everyone remembers 1961 for Maris, but he was far more than a one-year wonder. He was actually the American League MVP in 1960. He had 37 home runs, uh, 39 home runs, led the league in RBIs and slugging percentage. And years later, when he was with the Cardinals, 1967, he helped St. Louis beat the Red Sox to win the World Series that year as part of the Red Sox 86-year drill. It was in 1961, however, when Maris was at the height of his fame, or infamy, infamy, really. For years, he told friends he felt tortured by his pursuit of the record, mainly because he was never accepted by the media or the Yankee fans as being a true Yankee. The Yankee fans thought if anyone was to break Ruth's record, it should be Mickey Mantle, who they'd grown to love over the years, who though himself wasn't very popular when he started, as he replaced Joe DiMaggio in center field. The story is that the pressure got so great that Maris' hair began falling out in clumps during the end, near the end of the season. We all know what that feels like, right? <laughs> so, and while last he did break the record, on the last day of the season, hitting a home run against the Red Sox, win the game 1-0, only 22,000 fans were on hand at Yankee Stadium to watch him. As strange as it sounds, Maris contended that his career, and perhaps even his health, would have been better served if he had never hit the 61 home runs in the season. It's hard to fathom. Uh, over the past half century, though, he's gone from reviled to revered. And some of the same people who were reluctant to give him the record or credit for the record now want to see him reestablished as the record holder. That's because when he had his 60 home runs, no one ever accused Roger Maris of using steroids. And meanwhile, the three players who have since topped 60 home runs in a year, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, and Barry Bonds. Cheated. Cheated, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> they're released. If they didn't cheat, they're high on that list of suspicion. So, um, speaking of Bonds and home runs, number 714 and 755 are also in the book. 714 is, of course, the number of home runs Babe Ruth ended his career with, and 755 is the number that Hank Aaron finished with, breaking Ruth's record. Now we all remember that Bonds broke Aaron's record last year, but who knows how many home runs Barry Bonds ended with? Close. See, it, it, I had to look it up, Adam. It's 762. Uh, but it's a number that I don't think is ever going to carry that cachet at 714 or 755 to, just because of all the questions about Bonds. In fact, Barry Bonds should be more concerned with another number, 14, which is the number of counts of lying to a grand jury he was charged with last week. So he has, or maybe 5 to 10 or 10 to 20, depending on what happens there. So here's another special number from the book that I think you'll enjoy. 17 and 0. Wait a second. Maybe you won't enjoy that number. That was the number, the record of the Miami Dolphins in their perfect 1972 season the only perfect season in the history of the NFL, and a number of the Patriots almost sent to the recycle bin last year. But what made the Dolphins' season so remarkable is that from the fifth game until the AFC Championship game, they relied on a backup quarterback, Earl Marl, to keep them undefeated. Now, Patriot fans, be honest with me. How many of you think the Patriots would have been in a position for an undefeated season if they had to rely on Matt Castle instead of Tom Brady for what essentially was 10 games. Hands? Yeah. No. <laughs> so, now, Morrow was a great quarterback. He had been an MVP uh, previously and won a Super Bowl, but he's still 38. And in fact, uh, when he got sent into the game, it's, uh, one of the, after Bob Greasy broke his leg in the fifth game, they, 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 they looked down, 38 years old, hadn't taken a snap all year, and they said, get out those cataracts and get on the field. Take us down to victory. And he did it 10 straight times. So, pretty impressive. Now, the story gets better. After the Dolphins won their first 16 games, 
after they led the league in scoring and had the best defense, and after Greasy was back as the starting quarterback, they still entered Super Bowl seven as the underdog against the Washington Redskins. Talk about no respect. Well, they won that game 14 to seven over Washington, but about the only bad thing that happened to the Dolphins all season came late in the fourth quarter of that game. I don't know, people have probably seen the video on football follies. Uh, the Dolphins complain it's the only video ever shown. Uh, Gallery of Premier is sitting, standing there trying to kick a field goal at the end of the game. And there's poetic justice if he makes this field goal. The Dolphins will win the game 17 to 0 to cap a 17 and 0 season. It's terrific. What a story. The sports writers are going to have a feast with this. It's going to be part of history. The field goal gets blocked. And in the craziness that ensued, the Premier picks up the ball, tries to run with it, and throws it over, I think basically over his head. A Washington receive, Washington defender catches the ball, runs in for a touchdown. 14 to seven, all of a sudden Washington has a sliver of hope that they can come back and beat this undefeated team. Jake Scott, who was the quarterback for the Dolphins, and they eventually named the game's MVP, grabbed your premium on the sideline, yanked him into his face and said, if we lose this game, I'll kill you. So, and I Googled this last week. So I don't know if anything's happened since. But according to Google, Gary Premium is still alive. So <laughs> I love happy endings. <laughs> By everyone, 14 to 7. OK, so let's move on from a bad Boston sports memory to a sweet one, or as I would call it, a splendid one. 406. Does anyone know what 406 is? Ted Williams. Ted Williams. Ted Williams. It hit 406 in the 1941 season making him the last major leaguer to bat 400 for a year. That's 67 years ago now and counting. Amazing. Think, when you think of all the great hitters who have come and gone. Even more amazing is that he was not the MVP that year. The award went to Joe DiMaggio, who that year had a little thing called a 56-game hit streak. So, but could have gone either way. But what amazes me about Williams' feet is that on the final day of the season, he comes into the final day, the Sunday at the end of the season, Batting, and I looked this up, 0.3999955, which by any calculation would be regarded as a 400 average. I mean, you have to round that up at some point. Okay. But it still wasn't good enough for Williams. He was a perfectionist who didn't want to have anyone question his feet, especially a media that he had already grown to dislike and distrust. And this might have been only his third or fourth year in the league. He learned quick. So Williams played that last day, and not one game, but two. Both ends of a doubleheader against the then Philadelphia Athletics. In game one, he pounded out four hits, including his 37th home run, and ran his average up to 404. And as crazy as it sounds, he played in the second game, got two more hits, and pushed his average up to 406, the last player to hit 400. Does anyone here think there's an athlete in the world today who would risk history by going out and playing on those, that last day? Anyone? can't imagine. Could you imagine the fodder for sports talk radio if someone went out and did that and then had an offer? It would never happen. So now during my research for the book, I came to appreciate many familiar numbers uh, and the achievements they represent even more. Most, of, most importantly, number 42, Jackie Robinson. Uh, that's now retired uniform number he wore when he broke baseball's color, color barrier back in 1947. Until that year, and it's hard for young people to understand this, Till that year, Major League Baseball was exclusively for whites. Blacks had to play in their own league. But there was a Dodgers general manager named Branch Rickey who carefully orchestrated the whole thing, starting years earlier, to find a way to get Jackie Robinson into the major leagues. Now, I, I never comprehended the level of hatred and more to the point, ignorance that was hurled toward a good and decent man like Jackie Robinson, not just from fans either, but from the media, from opposing players and coaches, and even his own teammates who didn't want to see that color barrier broken. I also learned a lot about sports I previously knew nothing about. NASCAR is not one of my passions, but tracing and, and learning the story of number three, the intimidator, Dale Earnhardt, came close to making me wonder. I mean, you, Earnhardt, at age 48, finally won the Daytona 500, the biggest race in NASCAR, age 48. Yeah, that's, Four years from now, I couldn't imagine driving 200 miles around the track and beating everyone else. 
But yeah. on, he lost his life on that same track, tragically, four years later, on the final lap at the Daytona 500. Uh, and what I discovered while researching Earnhardt's story is that NASCAR, more so than any other sport, has a bond between fan and athlete that melds the two together. And what I've learned is it really shows you why, again, us New Englanders can't always figure it out, why it's so popular, but you learn why the sport is so popular around the country. Fan and, and athlete meld as one because there's a connection there. Fans spend a weekend there. They actually get to meet these drivers. It's an amazing story that, that you learn about NASCAR. Honestly, as I go through the book, I like all the stories. And I know that comes as a shock to you guys. Uh, author's bias, I'll call it. But the one that epitomizes what Numbelievable is all about is the story of Evil Knievel. Knievel was a motorcycle daredevil during the 1960s and 70s who recently passed away. Now, we got him into the book with the number 35, which is, which is the purported number of bones he broke during his daredevil jumping career. 35 bones. So the actual number is probably quite higher. I actually saw 55 <laughs> in one source, but I'm not going to exaggerate. So, but even if he never had injured an internal organ or couldn't tell Harley Davidson from John Davidson, he would still be a great subject for a TV movie, one of celebrity reality shows, or psychotherapy. Uh, and if, they, if you'll let me, I, I do want to just, I'll read the story, one story from the book about Evil Knievel. And like I said, this epitomizes what the book is all about. It says, Evil Knievel cracked his own formula for fame. For most sports stars, fame comes through broken records. For Robert Craig, Evil Knievel was all about broken bones. He had 35 of them, or maybe it was 40, or 53, depending on the sport story being spun. It doesn't matter, except that with each failing jump, Knievel seemed to become more famous, an American icon who was equal parts P.T. Barnum and G.I. Joe. Even if he had never jumped, his life story would make an interesting TV miniseries. He owned the plane that billionaire Howard Hughes died in, spent two years as a roommate to actor Kelly Savalas, and was in the same jail as Charles Manson. So, it's amazing. Yet it was on a motorcycle, or being thrown from one, where most of the world learned of Knievel. His love of bikes and stunts came as a child from seeing Joey Chitwood's auto daredevil show would ever visit his hometown of Butte, Montana. At age 15, he re received his first motorcycle, a BSA 125 Bantam from his father. Knievel, though, wasn't simply a biker. Physically talented, mentally tough, he developed into an exceptional athlete who won ski jump competitions, ran track, and even played minor league hockey for the Charlotte Clippers of the Eastern Hockey League. He was only 21 years old when he launched his own hockey team, the Butte Bombers. Artfully playing the role of showman and promoter, Knievel even convinced the vaunted Czechoslovakian Olympic team to come to Butte for a tune-up game before the 1960 Squaw Valley Games, a game incidentally that the United States won. Following a mix of successful jumps and disastrous crashes, Knievel leaped into the headlines on New Year's Eve 1967 when he attempted to jump 151 feet across the famous fountains of Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. What happened that day was spectacular on all fronts. The venue, the crash, and especially the fame. With thousands looking on and the stunt being filmed for ABC's Wide World of Sports, another show from, from our youth, Knievel's cycle suddenly lost speed as it approached a ramp. He still cleared the fountains but landed awkwardly at the other end, causing him to fly over the bike, crash onto the pavement, and roll like a tumbleweed for several yards. Knievel broke his back and crushed his pelvis, and additionally fractured his hip, his wrist, and both ankles. He quote, how about this, I got hurt real bad at Caesar's Palace, <laughs> said another stated Knievel. Landed on my head. That was the most serious of all. I remember the whole thing, every tiny bit of it. There was a little six-foot safety, safety ramp, and I landed right on top of it. The accident left Knievel in a coma and unconscious for nearly a month. But when he woke up, Knievel must have felt like he was living a dream. Overnight, he'd become internationally famous. His celebrity continued to grow, leading to a 1974 pay-per-view event in which he sought to jump Idaho's Snake River Canyon. But following hype usually reserved for a championship boxing match or a Super Bowl, the stunt wasn't done. The parachute on a SkyCycle X2 deployed before they had left the launch pad, causing Knievel to simply glide across the canyon and ran into the opposite wall. Although he wasn't seriously hurt, 
He knew not much separated him from death that day. Still, his fame continued to soar. In May 1975 at Wembley Stadium, in front of a crowd estimated at 100,000, Knievel attempted to jump 13 double-tiered city buses. <laughs> he cleared 12. <laughs> Wasn't enough. And shattered his pelvis. Before an ambulance could cart him off to the hospital, he grabbed a microphone, told, told the audience he was going to retire. But later that year, he came back to perform a stunt that attracted the largest audience in the history of wide world sports, sailing over 14 Greyhound buses at Kings Island Amusement Park in Ohio. He then had his jump the shark moment, literally, in 1976. Knievel had planned to jump, jump a tank of great white sharks on live TV at the Chicago Amphitheater, but the daredevil crashed violently during a practice run and was forced to cancel the show. After that, he made only occasional jumps, mostly with his son, Robbie, before retiring for good in 1981. One of Knievel's favorite quotes during the height of his racing fame was, a man can fall many times, but he's never a failure until he fails to get up. To prove the point, no matter how many times he fell, evil Knievel always got up. So, pretty cool stuff. Uh, now, I'm not going to say Evil Knievel was a perfect person or should be the role model for any of the young people out here. But I do think there was an inner good about him, a sense of right and wrong. And you'll see this. There's some books upstairs on, on him. You'll, you'll, you'll learn that he took responsibility when he did some dopey things. He took responsibility, and he knew that he was being watched by children. That's why he always wore white instead of black, and why he spelled his name evil. Everybody, evil, bad. He spelled it E-V-E-L, just to make the point that he wasn't. So, very interesting guy. Uh, so he was one of those great guys. Uh, and, and researching people like Knievel was a lot of fun. But also, I not going to say he made enemy, uh, enemies during this process, but I did come to dislike publishers and editors during this process. <laughs> <laughs> we had about three dozen entries that got cut from the book because of space. So for those of you wondering why your favorite number got left out, I will gladly pass along the phone numbers and emails for those <laughs> So I'll tell you that the toughest one for me to leave out was 1.12, which was Bob Gibson's jaw-dropping earned run average during the 1968 baseball season. Gibson is another one of those amazing stories. He nearly died from disease as a child, later played basketball for the Harlem Globetrotters, and was one tough SOB on the mound. Tim McCarver, uh, who I think a lot of people know as a broadcaster, but he was actually the Cardinals catcher at the time, he used to fear going out to ever say anything to the pitch to Gibson, the way catchers and pitchers would normally communicate. One time he tells a story that he would go out, he went out to see Gibson to you know, straighten out signs or wonder why he's being shaken off on a sign. Gibson sneered at him, pointed at him, told him to get behind the plate and said, McCarver, the only thing you know about good pitching is that you can't hit it. So, McCarver acknowledges that Gibson was at least half right. So, if we could have another few months to, do, to wait and do the book, I would have thrown in uh, one of the great numbers from last year, which was 253, which was the number of consecutive games started by uh, uh, Packers quarterback Brett Favre. Uh, when you given the physicality of football, the vulnerability of that position, I place that number as the most impressive consecutive game streak ever. More impressive than Cal Ripken, who played 2,632 consecutive baseball games. So, especially when you consider that nearly 60 NFL quarterbacks started games this past year alone. Plus, just like Knievel, Favre is one of the most interesting people uh, you'll come about, you'll come across in sports. Um, other great numbers, real quick, from this past year: we had a 30 to three baseball game last year that I would have loved to have written about. Texas Rangers. Texas Rangers beat up on the uh, Baltimore Orioles. That's right. We had a 34-32 upset by Appalachian State in college football over Michigan. One double team beating Michigan in front of 105,000 fans. And lastly, we had the Mets collapse, where they blew a seven and a half game lead with 17 to play in September. Like that. What made that story the best part for me was that I'm a Phillies fan and I got to see them pass them right by. Also, unfortunately, we couldn't work any North Reading numbers into the book. But given the audience, I did some homework and came armed with just a few for you. Let's see if you guys can guess, guess what any of these numbers represent. Okay. 661 batting average. Any ideas? 
North Reading, number 661 Batting Avenue. Frank Carey. Uh, you know, save that answer for the next question. <laughs> <laughs> that was what, step. What generation? It's a hint of that. Last year. Oh, that, <laughs> that was Stephanie Main's batting average for last year's North Reading softball team. Wow. The, the team that she helped carry the Division Three state championship. Incredible. Yeah. But just like the stories in the book, there's more to it. Once opposing coaches realized they couldn't get her out, they, gave, they intentionally walked her 15 straight times during the state playoffs. 15 straight times. Finally, one coach was brave enough, foolish enough. The pitcher, I would say the coach didn't have any choice. The bases were loaded when she came to the bat. Pitch to her. Anyone want to guess what the result was? Grand slam. Grand slam home run. Right. It helped uh, North Reading beat Turner's Falls 7-0 in the championship game. Amazing. Here's another one for you. 41 years. <laughs> Frank Carey? Frank Carey. A number of years he has coached the North Reading High School baseball team. He might outlast uh, Connie Mack. And he'll certainly have more, a better winning percentage than Connie Mack did. As of last year, Coach Carey had amassed 633 wins against just 237 losses. And this year's team, last time I checked, was 13-2. and two. You know, I, I know they had some games over the weekend. So another terrific team this year. Now, veering a little bit away from sports with the next one, but it's a North Reading number, 1853. Very good. The year North Reading was incorporated. So it broke away. So very good. Animal. Last one. Over 70,000 items. The answer is right in this building. Oh. Very good job. <laughs> it's a number of periodicals, audio and video cassettes, microfiche, microfilm, compact discs, CD-ROMs, DVDs, and books available here at Flint Memorial Library. Elena, how's that for a public service? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I know the library now is passes for people to attend the, the New England Sports Museum, which is located at the in Boston, at the TD Bank North Garden. You should take advantage of this opportunity. Elena can tell you more, I'm sure. Sports Museum is a wonderful, but underused, treasure for the area, and a place where a lot of the numbers in this book are brought to life. So, now, I know there's some young people here tonight, so the final part of this talk is for, for you guys. So listen up. Young men and young ladies, I'm here to tell you that your love for sports does not have to end when you stop playing games and that you can have a successful career in sports, yes, that means making money. <laughs> Even if you never hit a home run or made a game-winning basket. I'm living proof of that fact. <laughs> because if you sports gave out grades, I would have been a straight C student. But I constantly played sports as a kid because I love being outside, I love playing games, I love making new friends and being with my existing ones. But then in addition to playing sports, I was a certified stat geek. I was the type of kid, this is a true story, who would beg my, my Little League baseball coach to give me the scorebook so I could take it home, run home, sit at my kitchen table, get a calculator, pencil, and, and paper, and figure out everyone's batting average mm -hmm. and bring it back before the next game so everyone had it. It was a good way for a very average player to be one of the most popular kids on the team, trust me. <laughs> Especially I used to pump up the averages a little bit. <laughs> and so, now also around the, that's geeky, I know. So. <laughs> now also around, at the age of 14, I started a magazine. A pro wrestling magazine of all things. <laughs> now I know the story's getting a little weird, but stick with me. I'd watch the matches, sometimes go to the live shows over the spectrum or over the high schools and stuff like that. Type up stories, make copies of the articles, um, ma uh, mail them out, and get it, out, get it out every month on deadline. I think subscribers, I think we once had as many as six subscribers. <laughs> and two of them were not even family members. So it was really good. So, but more than anything, the whole experience taught me the value of writing, researching, proofreading, and meeting a deadline. So what you guys have to do all the time with school and with science projects and all that. I also wrote for my high school paper, and while attending college, worked as a writer and stat keeper at the Boston University Athletic Department, where people actually paid me to attend football, basketball, and hockey games. I even got to travel with the teams on occasion. So in my friend's eyes, I went from geeky to pretty cool. So even today, especially today, I realize how fortunate I was. 
So that's because throughout my professional life, I've been blessed to be able to combine my love for sports with my love for writing. And one of the results of all that was this book. Well, I want the young people here to realize that there are thousands of jobs in athletics, and most of them have nothing to do with actually playing. So if you love sports, but can't hit a curveball, or fall down every time you try and skate backwards, don't become discouraged. Keep trying your best, but also remember there are tons of opportunities out there. You can become a broadcaster, a public address announcer, a scoreboard operator, a writer, an editor, a community relations director, a website manager, a stat keeper, a scout, a general manager, an owner, that's the best job of them all, a researcher, a cameraman, a photographer, the list goes on and on. And it's not just for men either. These professions are wide open for women. And many pro teams, colleges, and organizations are extremely eager to hire the best young woman available. So, with all that said, I'll turn things over to you. Any questions you might have about the book, what's in there and what's not, and about sports in general. I'll, and if you haven't been able to tell by the accent or some of the short stories, I did grow up in the shadows of the Spectrum in Redwood Stadium down in Philly. And one of my favorite sports moments as a youngster was Game 7 of the 1982 NBA Eastern Conference Finals when the Sixers were playing up against their dreaded arch rival, the Boston Celtics, and about to beat them in Game 7 on the Celtics' own parquet floor. And instead of booing, instead of throwing things, Instead of jeering their team or you know screaming at the Sixers, the chant rose up from the Boston Garden of B L A, B L A, and for me it was one of those goosebump moments of my life just to hear a team that I hated, I kind of still hate, uh, but, <laughs> but I gained a new level of respect for the fans of Boston and up here. So you can make fun of me. I the last time we won a title down there was 1983. I just read something today. Philadelphia teams have played 98 seasons since the last Philadelphia team won a championship. All you guys spent Saturdays in the winter and in the fall going to these championship parades and enjoying it. So enjoy it while you can. So, so bring it on, because I can handle it. <laughs> so, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yes? Um, you know how you're talking about Jackie Robinson? Is that why they have American League and National League? Because, like, American for, like, flights, or, like, did they make that a long time ago? No, nope, there's two leagues. There's the American League and the National League uh, back then. Um, the, uh, blacks play and African Americans played in the Negro Leagues. And they had teams in a lot of the big cities. Uh, I don't know if they had one up here. I'm not sure if there's one in Boston. But Kansas City had a team. Philadelphia had a team. Cleveland was, had a famous team. Josh Gibson was probably the most famous Negro League player hit, I think, over 800 home runs in the Negro Leagues. In fact, uh, Topps put out a baseball card honoring Josh Gibson last year. Uh, but Jackie Robinson was the first African-American player in the National League. Anyone know who the first African-American was in the American League? Larry Doby. I think it was Cleveland Indians, I want to say, one year later. Pro football actually broke the color barrier a year earlier in 1946. And baseball followed suit in 1947. Any, any, anyone else? Yes? Well, this is about this year. Uh, did you read the Sports Illustrated about the man who's been surfing every day for the last 25 years of his life? <laughs> no. I did not. I haven't um, read it yet. In Hawaii. I mean, he has, I mean, for the, did anybody else read that? I heard of it. I can't yes. remember the number, but I can't remember the number. he's unable to go visit his in law. I mean, things happen. He couldn't get married for anyway. <laughs> <laughs> was it a recent Sports oh. Illustrated? I, I, I can tell you one. I think which is available there. upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give anyone any ideas. I, I, can, I didn't make it as far as Hawaii, but when I was in Arizona in February, I, I told my wife, it's a good thing I didn't pack more because I might not come back. It was beautiful out there, and you guys have ice storms and snow and all that sort of stuff. So, hey. Sean, just wondering what's your favorite game to watch or report on? Uh, baseball. I, I think I grew up a baseball fan more than anything from a, from a young age. Uh, so, uh, baseball, I always think of it as a thinking man's game. It's certainly a game that lends itself to a lot of numbers. Um, I, you know, I, 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 and the thing about baseball, I know people say, you know, four, <laughs> foul ball, foul ball, pitching change. But, you know, there's always a chance in baseball, and this is true, in any baseball game, something could happen that you've never seen before. And it's true whether you know, it's an unassisted triple play or a no-hitter by a cancer survivor 
or any number of things. It, it's, it, it's so unique. It's a specific play could take place that is just uh, uh, unprecedented or rather rare that it comes across once every generation. So the thing is you have to pay attention. And so stale balls do come back fast. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Right. How many home runs did the guy from Japan, Sadaharu, Oh. Now you're quizzing me. <laughs> oh, uh, what's the quiz? Is he up? I, I want to say 700 in the 740s. I thought he had more than Ruth. Maybe it was yeah. even more than that. But I think he was considered what the all time pro baseball uh, champion. So give me the I'll email you the answer. <laughs> well, that'll be the sequel, won't it? Yes. Unbelievable, <laughs> too. What's your least favorite baseball team? My least favorite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do I have to answer that question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Probably the Mets. You know, I have no other reason, no idea why. Just the Mets, because they're big. Oh, I'm sorry. So, um, but even with them, I could pick out wonderful players. David Wright's a terrific young player at third base. Jose Reyes is one of the best shortstops going. So, Johan Santana. They're the team to beat in the National League East if they don't win it. You know. So we'll see. Yes. Why are you talking about Barry Bonds if he's not a good? Role model for children. Well, I, you know, <laughs> you know, not everyone in sports is a good role model, unfortunately, and not all the numbers in good are, in sports are good. Uh, we have a chapter called uh, "Bumbling, Stumbling, Fumbling" that's in that's in in here about the most infamous numbers in all of sports, and whether it's John Vandervelt's uh, seven, which we talked about, or Ben Johnson running in nine point seven nine in the 1988 Olympics, only to find out that he cheated to get his record. You know, I think. Uh, it's important to expose cheaters or some of the bad things that happen in sports because they're certainly part of sports history as well. Okay. Um, in the Time for Kids magazine, there was a lady who ran a running race and she got cheated and everyone liked her, but then she had to like, go to jail. What's her name? Uh, Rosie Ruiz. Uh, <laughs> and she's in the book, uh, in, that, in that chapter. W50 is the... And that, the reason that's in there is because that was the uniform number that she had. Um, and yet for, I don't know how long she actually fooled people. I think by later that day or certainly the next day, it had come out that they thought she cheated. And then they went back and she'd done the same thing in the New York Marathon. So well, she just never subway. prospered. Yeah, right. Subway, right. Yeah, they were pretty right. sure, they, right. even at the end of the race, I think, that they didn't like, want to make an official statement until they went back. Right. What was... I think I don't know if it's in here or not, but we got you know one of the lines was one if by land, two if by sea, and three if by the MBTA. So Rosie Ruiz followed that. Do you think that the meteor is making things like more negative? I mean, I'm just thinking back, like Ty called people that people look back now and say I'm like as great as people thought. Uh, you know, it's a great question. I think much like 24-hour news cycles and cable news has made news more negative or more picky, and nothing can go uncovered. I think 24-hour sports and the plethora of sports stations and, mm -hmm. and TV and reporters and websites, every little thing now gets picked apart. And yeah, you know, we don't have as many heroes anymore. Because I'm thinking like Barry Bonds type of situation, it's obviously not good, but it's blown up over and over and over so that... I, 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 I mean, I have like mixed feelings of how, right. how much that should be covered. They right. should be... Uh, you know, and years yeah. ago, they would, cut, they would protect players. Yeah, and, you know, they whether, they now, they weren't doing anything that great or that bad, but the writers and, and the athletes had a bond pretty much. Right, right. Uh, that doesn't exist anymore. I think a lot of it is that the one reporter is afraid he's going to get scooped by another reporter and made to look bad. So, yes? Is the media bad or good? The media is generally good. Like anything, I think you could say 97% of them are good. Uh, and you got to take the good with the bad. I don't think... Athletes who refuse to speak to the media do themselves any favors. The media is there to cover you when you win. And I used to impress, I was a PR director for many years, I used to impress upon our coaches and our athletes, talk when you lose. Take responsibility, be upfront about it. These guys are there and covering you and writing great things about you when you win. By being good to them, they might write kind things about you when you lose. They'll think you're a good guy. They'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Uh, because the one thing that you need to have as an athlete or a PR director or as a writer is credibility. So you can pretty much at some point separate the good from the bad and, and uh, good writers from the bad writers. But I'll tell you, in the end, those bad writers get found out. Nobody wants any part of them. So. Yes? Um, I don't have a 
very much of a mathematical mind. And I'm wondering, when we are watching games, do you have little statistics playing in your head? <laughs> you know, do you track of that kind of stuff naturally? I, I probably I mean, yeah, yeah. You had a remarkable lack of the ability to remember birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am intrigued by stats and, and, uh, and do retain them meaningless tidbits of information uh, that I'm accused of. I think more and, and equally like with stats, the writer background. A lot of times I'm watching the game and I would I'll sit there and think, what would my lead be? Or if I was Bob Ryan tonight, if I were Bob Ryan tonight, well, who would I want to write about? So I start thinking that and what a good, fun, creative lead or headline would be uh, by the third quarter of a basketball game or the seventh inning of a baseball game. And then you hope no one comes and ruins it for you because that <laughs> always happens. You know, you're tightening it in and right then somebody hits a home run, they, they ruin everything. So. This is a question, just what would you suggest to anybody that's interested in pursuing a career in, in sports broadcasting or sports journalism? What would be the best thing for them to concentrate on? Well, I always say it's never too late, and it's certainly never too early. I, I, I find writing opportunities at the town paper. See what's going on at school, what kind of publications are there at school. Or if you belong to a club and you think they might need a newsletter, do the newsletter. Uh, create a website. Uh, create a blog. I think there's two ways to go. Either you become a jack of all trades and learn a lot, or learn a little bit about a lot of sports, or you become an expert in one and you really become a go-to person at some point in your life over one sport. You commit yourself to learning all you can and the ins and outs and nuances. Say uh, uh, the NFL draft. Maybe some of you, when you think the NFL draft, is there a name that comes to mind and who knows more about the NFL draft than anyone else? Is Mel Kuyper. He's a guy with the big hair. But he became branded as the NFL draft guru over the course of years. Dick Vitale. Basketball. So, you know, there, there's two ways to go about it. Either, you know, really learn a lot and then you can fill in spots. And I, I, I tell young people, learn a lot of things. Learn how to type. Gosh, people don't know how. Learn how to oversee a website. Uh, learn how to be a photographer. Uh, you, you know, learn how to uh, learn a, a layout and design program. The more skills you have like this, the more valuable a person you're going to be as, as a prospective employee. And it's never too learn too early to learn those things. Uh, you know, I took typing when I was 16. People were like, what are you doing that for? You know, and as it turned out, it, it helped me a lot because it, it well, you know, for a lot of reasons. So, okay. <laughs> yes? Um, you think that the book is do you think that you did a lot of work on the book, or like, who do you think did the most work? <laughs> <laughs> like, do you think that Dick Vitale is getting too much? Credit? Not at all. He was um, great with the book and, and helped sell a lot of books. I, I'll tell you one thing. I, you know, the book took eight years, really. I thought of it back in 1997 on it. Of all things, a bus ride to Ithaca, New York. I was telling Mark beforehand. Six hour bus ride to Ithaca, New York, your mind can wander. So I, I decided to put it to good use. And then it sat. It sat for eight years until I mentioned it to a friend who helped get it to an agent who sold it to a publisher. <coughs> so after selling eight years, we sell it on November 15th, my busiest time of year with the Super Bowl coming up. The publisher turns around and says, okay, we need it by Janu January 31st. So after eight years of sitting on this idea, I had about 75 days to write it. Now we pushed them back for about a month, got an extra month out of them, and they said, don't worry, you'll have time, you'll get to edit it, because we felt we rushed through things. So you'll, you'll get that, don't worry. So February comes and goes, March comes and goes, April, May, June, July. Midway from August, we get a FedEx package from the publisher saying, here's the book. You have 48 hours to read it and get us back any changes. So that's, a, that's another reason I don't like publishers or readers. The hidden reason. Anything else? If you don't mind, what do you do, Dan? Well, I'm, a, I'm an editor at a publishing company. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, publisher in Lynn, family publishing company, that we do the Super Bowl program, oh, okay. the Pro Bowl program, and the U.S. Open Tennis program. We actually do 500 books a year. Wow. Um, also work for Harvard. And, uh, and so all my day, people ask me, do you, what books do you read? I go, oh, I read all day. <laughs> I read tennis stories, football stories. Then I reread them and read them again. You know, by, the, by the end of the night, the time I get home, I just want to hey, turn on the TV for a little bit. So I'm more of a writer, unfortunately, than a reader, but I have a stack of books this high at home um, that I'll read someday. Well, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone for coming. Let's have some snacks. I'm going to have the Ryan hand out um, some numbers here. And I'm going to just draw a number afterwards. And uh, whatever number we draw out, oh, you get to draw it. Okay. okay. I give a number to each person, and we'll give out a book to people. Also, I'll tell you that if anyone's interested in buying a copy of the book, I do have a few here with me. Um, they make a great Father's Day gift, wonderful Flag Day gift. <laughs> even early Christmas. Even at early Christmas. <laughs> and Memorial Day is coming up. That special person in your life. So I do have a few, and I'd be happy to sign them for you. So, have, have, snacks. have snacks. Most importantly, have snacks. Again, thank you for coming and giving up your night, and thank you to the library. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>